Hello everyone. You may remember last week we reflected on the call of Isaiah 800 years before Christ to the people of Israel to seek the Lord for mercy, forgiveness, reconciliation as well as peace and happiness without delay. For he said that their ways were not God's ways and neither were their thoughts divine thoughts. Then about 200 years later, the prophet Ezekiel reproached the people for indicting or accusing God of being unfair. To counter the accusation that Yahweh is unfair and unjust, the prophet contrasted God's readiness to forgive and grant life to a sinner with a righteous man who became wicked. Friends, what was the issue behind this? Why did the Israelites in the first place accuse God of unfairness? We need to read the introductory part of the 18th chapter of the book in order to understand the problem. The prophet wanted to challenge the Israelites of three things. An old belief common among the Israelites, their attitude towards sinners, and God's response to their attitude. The old belief was a part of the Ten Commandments found in the book of Exodus chapter 20 verse 5. I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God, and I punish your parents' fault in their children, the grandchildren, and the great-grandchildren among those who hate me. That is to say that the Lord Yahweh would punish children for the fault of their parents. To the third and fourth generations. But now Ezekiel was asked to proclaim a new message from God. He began announcing that God wanted the people to do away with a saying, Parents have eaten unripe grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. It implies that children suffer the consequences of the sins of their parents. Friends, if we eat sour or unripe grapes, naturally the effect upon our teeth is immediate. Our teeth are set on edge or become blunt. However, according to the proverb, the effect is first felt by the children. It so happened that soon after the fall of Jerusalem, when the righteous were carried into exile and inflicted suffering together with the wicked, they began to complain that they were being punished for the sins of their forefathers. But the prophet refuted the notion by citing an example. He described God's response to three generations of a family. There is a certain man who is good and righteous. He neither worships idols nor commits adultery, nor oppresses anyone nor cheats others for money, but shares his own food and clothing with the poor. Because he is upright in God's eyes, he wins God's favor and will live. Now, this man has a son who is prone to violence and bloodshed. He chooses to do everything wrong. He is not upright and by God's judgment shall not live. And then his son, in spite of seeing all the sins that his father has committed, does not imitate him, but abstains from evil. He acts righteously like his grandfather. So he too finds favor with God and therefore he will live and not die. Here, dying is probably not a reference to physical death, but a symbol of separation from God, or a loss of divine favor, who is the source of life. In like manner, the sinner who turns away from wickedness and chooses the path of righteousness and justice will live united with God, the source of life. Besides the change of the belief, the prophet wanted to change their attitude toward the sinners and God. 
because the people remembered the sins of others and condemned them over and over again. A sinner was regarded as a sinner always. So the prophet compared two kinds of people, which we read in today's text. He reminded them that as it is possible for a virtuous person to turn away from virtue and lose the favor of God and neighbors, it is also possible for a wicked person to renounce his sins and follow God's commandments and win God's grace and mercy. Both persons showed a change in behavior. The righteous person sinned, but the sinner repented. God seems to punish the righteous who turned sinner by withholding his grace and reward the sinner for his repentance. Is this injustice on God's part? Is God expected to forego deserved punishment to the first man because of the good deeds performed earlier by him who is now a sinner? Is God only to remember the past sinfulness of the second man and not reward a significant change in his life? Through these illustrations, the prophet reminded the people that the justice of God is not dispensed according to the merits or good works that have accumulated throughout one's past history, but rather it corresponds to the character of the person's present life, to the kind of person one has become. Friends, what is the message for us? 1. Our sin is not automatically passed down from generation to generation. Neither is righteousness. It is our own sins, not the sins of our parents and others, that gets us in trouble. Therefore, instead of blaming others for our suffering, let us each of us take personal responsibility for our own sins. 2. God has given us the freedom to make choices. We are free at any time to turn from wickedness to righteousness and vice versa. 3. When it comes to retribution, only the person seems to count for God. God judges us not on what we were, but what we are here and now. We are judged by the new life to which we have turned. Sins of the past are less significant than the conversion of the present. Today's Gospel also makes a similar point. The first son disobeys his father when he is asked by his father to go to the vineyard, but later he changes his mind and goes. The rebel who turns to obedience is regarded as righteous. 4. Often we tend to accuse God of being unfair and unjust. In fact, it is we who are unfair to him. Let us stop blaming God for our misfortunes, but instead constantly examine our life and repent of our sins which will lead to much suffering. 5. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving. He forgives a repentant sinner. He remembers none of our sins. Therefore, let us humble ourselves and acknowledge our sins committed against Him and others. 6. While we are honestly striving to be righteous before God, there are always temptations to commit a grave sin, and as a result, we lose favor with God. So, let us always pray that we may be guided in God's truth and path for our life, always so that we may avoid sin and live in peace and happiness. Amen. God bless you.